Hi, everyone. I want to welcome everyone today. My name is Catherine Gagnon. My pronoun is her. I work for the mobilization and recruitment at the Professional Institute. Shortly, we'll be becoming our guest speaker, Julie Lalonde, an actually known, recognized public educator and women's rights activist. Thank you, Julie. She'll be joined by one of our hosts for the evening, Jen Carr, NCR director, and also Jen Esnard, and also an NCR director, and Ray Paquette has been a prominent ally and supporter from the get-go. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some of the technical details of the webinar to ensure that everyone can actively participate in today's session. I wanted to let you know that today's presentation will be recorded and it will be available on our website later this week. I also want to assure you that everyone's participation will remain confidential. This is a safe space. As you likely realized, audio is being provided through the webinar service. To reduce background noise and ensure the quality of the audio for your fellow participants, we have muted all participants' lines. We'll be opening up lines during the question and answer section of the presentation. In the meantime, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, open the chat tab in Zoom and submit your question to ask a question. The chat function can be accessed at the bottom center of your screen. If you're not able to see it, move or hover your mouse over your screen. For those logging in on mobile, the same process will apply. Select the chat icon, locate at the bottom right corner of your screen, select ask a question, and hit send. Please keep in mind that opening the chat function on your mobile device will tempor temporarily hide the slide deck. We'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the session, so if you have any issues, please don't hesitate to send us a message. Again, everything remains confidential. For the visual, in the center of your screen, you should currently see the title slide of the slide deck. It'll be put up there momentarily. We'll, as we move throughout the presentation, you will see the slide change. If at any point you don't see slide changes or you lose the visual connection, please, please let us know using the chat box. Throughout the webinar, you can always select the account, ask a question, to send a question for the question period. If you look at the drop down menu, when you select the chat, select the ask a question and you will be able to send your question for the question period. Now I'd like to introduce Jen Carr, uh, one of our NCR directors. Hi, Jen. Hi, Catherine, how are you tonight? I'm good, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for helping us put this together. Okay, so um, hi everybody. I'm so excited that you could join us tonight. For those who, of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Carr. I am one of four NCR directors and I've been a proud PIP student for over 15 years. I'm honored tonight to co-host this event with my fellow uh, NCR director and a union sister, uh, NCR director Jenny Esnard. We have a very dynamic and knowledgeable speaker tonight. Julie S. Alond is an internationally recognized public educator and women's rights activist who will share her experiences, both personal and professional, with us tonight. Firstly, let me say that while this presentation tonight will focus on violence against women, Domestic violence does not discriminate along gender lines. Male, female, gay, transgendered, or non-binary, everyone can be affected by domestic violence. Domestic violence comes in many forms, both physical and psychological, and no individual's experience is ever the same. 
Domestic abuse from a partner, spouse, parent, or even a son and daughter can have lasting impacts on the individual experiencing the toxic actions of another. It also has far reaching impacts on the workplace. In 2014, the Canadian Labour Congress partnered with the University of Western Ontario to study the impacts of domestic violence on the workplace. One in three workers have experienced domestic violence in their lifetime. Of those who had, 82% found that domestic violence negatively affects their performance at work through distractions, tiredness, lateness, interruptions at work from the abuser, poor concentration, and absenteeism. 53% said they experienced violence at or near the workplace. 38% reported that domestic violence affects their ability to get to work. 37 of those said that it ne negatively impacted their coworkers. And lastly, 5% said that they lost their job as a result of domestic violence. These are grim statistics, but are reflective of the situation that many of our coworkers face in silence. But there's good news from the support side. I am extremely proud to say that PIPS took a leadership role in pushing the federal government to provide paid leave for those employees and their dependents experiencing domestic violence. This monumental effort was led by the Auditing, Audit, Commerce and Purchasing Group, otherwise known as the AV Group, and their former president, Ray Paquette, who start, started addressing the issue of domestic violence in collective bargaining in 2013. I would like to pass the mic to my, uh, to my colleague, Ray, who will now give you an overview of how those negotiations progressed. Over to you, Ray. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome, everyone. You know, this has been a journey of love. It's also been a journey that has taken a lot of tolls on people. Um, I can tell you that in 2012, I was driving home from a PIPS meeting in Montreal late at night, not much on the radio, but there was a, a talk show on and it featured a woman, a union woman from Australia who was speaking about her, her passion for domestic violence and how over, I think it was 1.5 or 2 million people are covered in a collective agreement by uh, some clause for domestic violence. Well, that brought me, my mind started to turn around and I, when I got back to Ottawa the next day, I inquired with PIPS as to if they knew how many collective agreements in the federal government had domestic violence clauses. Well, it turns out there wasn't any. We did do some research. There were some around the country. Uh, one, for instance, was the uh, Yukon Teachers Federation, but they only allowed five days. But you can also imagine at that time, there was no provincial, really provincial legislation for leave for domestic violence. Uh, now, most of the provinces are allowing up to 10 days, whether paid or not paid, five days, not paid. Uh, anyways, so those people, um, are really starting to get on to what domestic violence means to the people of Canada. Uh, I felt we needed something. Um, I come from a family where my mom was abused uh, by my dad a lot. I do have six sisters and I wanted to protect them. And how could I do that? I mean, I was a, an adult and how could I help my sisters? Well, by talking to people. And I found that when we started to get the ball rolling on domestic violence, a lot of my peers were against it. They didn't want us to go ahead and, you know, try and get that in the collective agreement. There was, you know, bigger fish to fry in the world, but this meant a lot. And I remember the one thing I said to Treasury Board at the table was, if we can save one life by getting something in the collective agreement, then we've achieved something. So I want to just give you a little history on what happened. In 2013, the AV Group was ready to begin a new round of bargaining. And at the time, Treasury Board, led by the Harbor government, all they were interested in at that time was to 
remove our certainty provisions. We didn't think that was right anyways. But in preparation for the negotiations, the AV group put together our list of demands. I thought it might be a great idea to try and get some language on our collective agreement, in our collective agreement on domestic violence. I brought the issue to the Institute, and although they supported the idea, it was felt that if the AV group wanted to pursue the issue, it was fine with the Institute. Bargaining was really slow as it normally is, as most of the time in this bargaining session was spent on the inquiry demanding we accept a proposed replacement for our circuit leave. For almost three years, every time domestic violence was brought up at the table, the answer was no. Even though we were able to provide facts and statistics to try to recall. Finally, as we neared the end of the negotiation, the Treasury Board relented and we agreed on a memorandum of agreement to a joint committee to study the possibility of creating language for the collective agreement on domestic violence. During the same time frame, the Institute was busy negotiating improvements for our sick leave called the Employee Wellness Support Program. I was lucky enough to represent the AV group on the advisory table for uh, the negotiations it was decided that leave for domestic violence would be included as part of the EWSP negotiations and thus benefit PIPS members beyond the AV group, which is good because everybody would be able to uh, participate. And so I did talk to all the other presidents within PIPS to get their support. And, you know, let's go. We got we to gotta fight this. Get out there and ask your members what they think about domestic as I said, there was a lot of peer pressure to, like, let's just do this at another time. But I was hell bent on getting something done. In October 2017, we sent out a call letter to all PIPS members asking for volunteers to sit on the joint committee. It was greatly received. We got many, many applications, people wanting to be part of this negotiating session or sit down with Treasury Board figure out what would look good or what would help them the most in a collective agreement. We did choose seven women from across Canada. They were all survivors of domestic violence. If you had to sit there and listen to their stories, it would break your heart. It did mine many times and still does. We also uh, brought along David Chu, uh, an AB representative for the Atlantic region. For the next two years, we met with Treasury Board and discussed what lead for domestic violence would look like. Our members shared their personal stories, and many experts were invited to speak to the Joint Committee, which helped shape the decision making. Our final draft, agreed to by our committee and Treasury Board, was then reviewed by the EWSP Committee and Institute staff. Because the WSP was not to be implemented for a few years, it was decided that we needed something now to help our members experiencing domestic violence. The Institute sent the lead for domestic violence to the Institute's central table to negotiate terms for our current collective agreement. The parties agreed on a 10-day leave with pay. It's not what I would have liked. I would have liked more, and I'm sure our members would like, because 10 days does not heal everything. And we know that the 10 days is a start. It's in the collective agreement. That way we can fix it in, in the future. Or we can do anything we want to. So here are the highlights of the domestic leave provision. Domestic violence, is, of course, is considered to be any form of abuse or neglect that an employee or an employee's child experiences from someone with whom the employee has or had an intimate relationship. Now, when we look at that, we have to remember that the person who committed the domestic violence, we would not represent that person. That was made clear with Treasury Board, and they, they agreed that we should not be helping that person out at all. On request, an employee who is subject to domestic violence shall be shall be granted domestic violence leave with pay to seek care and or support for themselves or their dependent child 
to obtain services from an organization which provides services for individuals who are subject to domestic violence, to obtain professional counseling, to relocate temporarily or permanently, or to seek legal or law enforcement assistance, or to prepare for or participate in any civil or criminal legal proceedings. The total domestic violence leave with pay, which may be granted under this article, shall not exceed 75 hours in a fiscal year. Like I said, it's a start, it's 75 hours in a fiscal year. To me, it's not enough, but at least we're there. I would, you know, I would really like to thank a few people who helped out considerably in this. If staff, Laura Ross, Catherine Wright, who were the backbone of the of the PIPS committee. And, and I really want to thank the current AB president, Mr. Peter Gabriel, and his bargaining team for continuing the effort to bring this to fruition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray, for the historical context of how PIPS was successful in negotiating this historically for our members experiencing domestic violence. I was extremely proud of the work that the domestic committee members undertook and for the courage that they had coming forward to share their deeply personal stories. I wanna say that these are members who never uh, were involved in the union before and stepped forward to, uh, to make something uh, better for fellow um, workers. I was able to send the committee members a small token of appreciation, a fleece blanket embroidered with the saying, in the darkest skies, we see the brightest stars. Before we get to our excellent speaker, Julie, I wanna share a statement made by one of the domestic violence committee members. Thank you and the bargaining team for the beautiful blanket. The inscription is a per perfect testimony to our experience and effort to support others who need help when dealing with domestic violence. I am sincerely grateful for Pips to giving me a voice at the domestic violence table. Sharing my story was painful. For a while, I struggled to stay involved in the initiative after dredging up awful memories to give context to the argument for paid leave, but the result was worth it. The allocation of time off for domestic violence victims is not just about paid leave. It's about a validation that domestic violence can happen to anyone. And like any other injury, takes time to heal. So on behalf of PIPS members, I want to again, thank the domestic violence committee members for all of their hard work and dedication to ensure that similar situations, people in similar situations have the leave with pay to support them and their dependents. So now it's my pleasure to pass this webinar over to Julie to give us some well thought out personal and professional uh, experiences and to, to teach us a little bit more about domestic violence. Julie, all, all yours. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, and can folks see the presentation in big yeah it's on presentation mode you can see it all there's a little high five action happening perfect okay <laughs> so um a big huge thank you again for the invitation i think um obviously i believe very strongly in this issue and i think it's a really important discussion but i know that things are so weird this year um and so i know that um People are not always 100%, and so the fact that you're still providing this kind of teaching, I think, is really important and speaks to the values that you folks hold dear. So um, I'm really honored to be included in this discussion today. Uh, just a reminder, because it's my understanding that most of the stuff that you folks do is bilingual at the same time. So just a reminder that this presentation today is in English, and then demain c'est en français. Um, so if you have francophone colleagues, um, you, if you want to let them know that tomorrow night's session, same time, uh, same content, but will be happening in French. Um, yeah, so I come at this issue as someone who's been doing this work for almost 17 years. Um, and I come at this work as someone who has personal experience with intimate partner violence, uh, sexual violence, and stalking. 
Um, and so what I'm going to be providing with you for you today is a real kind of culmination of, um, of those two things. Um, I've been based in Ottawa for the past 17 years. I've worked uh, in sexual assault centers as a frontline worker. Um, so I have experience doing that one-on-one -on -one support. I've done tons of advocacy. I work with numerous organizations and I'm gonna be providing you with some really concrete resources at the end of the session. They're not my resources, they're just resources that I recommend um, that I you know, give my seal of approval to. Um, but please don't stop there. If this is something that you're interested in personally, professionally, um, please get in touch with me. I'm always happy to share stuff with folks. There's a lot of really great free accessible resources. So the issue right now is not lack of info. Uh, it's just getting the info out there. Typically, uh, my jam is to do stuff interactive. So it's not like me to just sort of talk at folks for about an hour or so. But the reality of online trainings is that's where we are. So big thanks to the folks who are going to be doing the chat. Um, and the dedicated Q&A later. But again, uh, that's my Twitter handle. I will give you my uh, information at the end of the session. If this is something that excites you, that you want more, um, please, please, please don't hesitate to get in touch. So I just wanna start with a recognition that it's a bummer of a topic. I know that. Uh, it's my job to go into spaces and talk about things that people don't wanna talk about. So I understand that this is heavy in and of itself but it also might be very real for you. So I recognize that um, I'm, you know, all the work that I do is as trauma informed as possible. Um, and I just wanna let you know that my goal is not to bum you out for an hour. <laughs> my goal is really to set the stage so that you know what it is we're dealing with in this country. But I want you to leave with some really concrete tools and things that you can do if you know someone or you suspect that someone in your life is experiencing this. Um, but it's heavy and I get that. Um, but just know that I'm, a, I'm like the queen of giving people tools so that they're not just bummed out. So stick with me <laughs> in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you're going to have some tools in your toolbox to really address this problem head on. I want to start with um, just doing a little bit of self-reflection. So uh, this is Kim Katrin, who if you don't know her, get on it. She is amazing. I would say she's probably the best public speaker I've ever seen. Um, she does incredible work. She also has a skincare company that she just launched. She's a yoga instructor. Um, but she's an, an educator on issues of equity, inclusion, and diversity, and just being authentic in the world uh, and she has this she completely and totally like blew my mind uh, about 10 years ago maybe more than that when I saw her speak and she talked about redefining the golden rule so most of us are aware of the golden rule I was certainly raised with it which is treat others the way that you would like to be treated and I think that's a really beautiful sentiment and there's certainly nothing inherently wrong with that but it's limited because you're still using yourself as the point of focus. You're treating people the way that you would wanna be treated. And Kim really challenged me and challenges her audience to think about, why don't we just treat people the way that they want to be treated? And if we do that, then we're actually meeting people's needs instead of assuming what people's needs are or assuming that what works for me works for everyone. And so this might, again, might be a very personal topic for you. And, you know, as a survivor and as someone who does, does this work, I can't put my personal experience aside when we talk about this, but I have to constantly remember that I am not the baseline for other people. And so things that I might not be impacted by, I can't dismiss it because it wouldn't bother me. Um, and so it's just really important for us to sort of think about, yes, you can think about your own experiences, but again, when you're looking at it from being an ally, being someone who's going to show up um, for victims and survivors, then you have to meet folks where they're at. And what you think is the right answer might not actually be the right answer because you're not walking in that person's shoes. So that's just kind of my challenge for you. And also because any opportunity I have um, to plug Kim's amazing work, I will take. Um, but I think it's a really good place to start of, I am not the baseline for everyone else. So what are we even talking about in this country? Well, it's pretty bleak. And as a white woman and a Canadian who travels and has conversations about violence against women around the world, 
oftentimes people, um, I remember specifically I was in Italy and the people were like, oh my God, you're from Canada. Tell me everything, like what's the utopia? Um, and I was like, I am not here to give you good news, folks. Um, misogyny is alive and well in this country too. So we live in a country in which one in three women, one in six men, and one in five trans folks will experience sexual violence in their lifetime. Um, I put a, an asterisk beside trans folks because our, our statistics on trans, non-binary, genderqueer people in Canada are not great. Um, and there's a lot of complexity around were you assaulted after you transitioned? Did that person know you were trans? There's just like a lot of stuff there. But I just want to flag it for you that we're not just talking about, you know, women and men in a cisgender binary way, but we are talking about something that's gendered. So, for example, one in six men will experience sexual violence, which, you know, might make you think, well, this isn't about gender because men also experience higher rates, which is true. But actually, what we're talking about most of the time is one in six boys. So if you're assigned male and you live your whole life as a man and you live to be maybe 14, 15, and you've never been sexually assaulted, the chances of it ever happening to you plummet dramatically at that moment. You actually become safer once you hit puberty. It's actually highest after that for men who are incarcerated and men who are in the military. Um, it's also slightly higher for men who date and sleep with men, but generally, if you're an adult man, the chance of you being sexually assaulted, it's probably gonna happen if you're incarcerated um, or if you're in the military. So again, when we're talking about sexual violence, sexual harassment, domestic violence, all of these things, I'm not saying that they don't happen to men, but we have to be realistic that they're disproportionately happening to women, girls, and gender non-conforming folks. We also live in a country in which a woman or girl is killed every two and a half days in Canada. Those statistics are thanks to the wonderful folks from the Canadian, oof, it's like a very awkward, it's like the Canadian Observatory, Femi Canadian Femicide Observatory for Justice and Accountability. Oui. <laughs> um, femicide in Canada, if you Google that, is the best way to get access to their work. Um, they're actually now, as of a few years ago, tracking rates of uh, domestic homicide and femicide in Canada and are actually able to paint a picture for us. So last year, 136 women and girls were killed in Canada. 100 of those were killed by men. 59% of those killed were killed by a current or former partner. So you know, more than half of the women killed in this country are killed by someone who claims to love them. Additionally, 26% of the women killed last year were killed by a family member. Um, so I really appreciate when uh, Jennifer at the top was talking about how we can't, you know, we can't erase family violence and in particular, um, you know, siblings, our, ch our own children, people that are part of our family. Um, just to paint a, a, a sort of more specific picture, when you're looking at women killed specifically by men, um, Nunavut, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan have the highest rates of women killed specifically by men in Canada. And again, these are from the Canadian Femicide Observatory of Canada. It's a very clumsy name, but um, Femicide in Canada, um, I think it's literally femicideincanada.ca, something like that. Um, they're the most accurate statistics that we have um, in this country regarding uh, rates of femicide. Girls and women with disabilities are four times more likely to experience sexual violence in Canada. Um, so, oh yeah, sorry, it's important that we have that there. Sorry, my screen froze. Um, Indigenous women are three times more likely to experience violence than myself as a white woman. Um, that includes domestic violence, workplace harassment, um, domestic homicide, all of those pieces. And then on top of that, we also live in a country in which less than 10% of sexual assaults are ever reported to the police. Um, that statistic wavers a little bit across the country, but there's nowhere that's actually reaching higher really than 10%. Um, so we're dealing with something that people don't feel comfortable talking about for a whole host of reasons. And so that's why it's so important that we focus on community. And that's why I've made the bulk of my career doing things like teaching bi-center intervention, talking about role of community, 
because even when people do report to police, that's not the first phone call that they make. They've confided in a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, a family member first, and then they pick up the phone and decide that they want to make a report. Um, so it's so important for us as community members, whatever that looks like, whether it's in your work community, if you're part of a sports community, a faith community, the art scene, Dungeons and Dragons, like whatever your world is, you're part of a little world where you're hearing stuff, you're seeing stuff. Um, and it's, it doesn't make sense for us to assume that, you know, it's not my job, the police will deal with this, um, because they're not. <laughs> uh, and even when people do report, um, they connect with community first. And in fact, having community supports is the best way that we can guarantee someone healing from their trauma. Um, so I really want us to sort of see this and sit with it and sit with the reality of what we're dealing with, but really heed the call that says like, okay, I can do something about this um, by checking in. It's also important for us to, to go beyond the cliches of, you know, why didn't she leave? Um, you know, all of why did she wait so long to report? Like, these are things that I wish I could tell you have gone away in the last few years. I wish I could tell you that, you know, post Gomeshi Canada, Me Too Canada has gotten to a place where we don't ask these questions anymore, but we do all the time. Um, and so this is a really good, simple visual. It's called the power and control wheel. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, it's based out of the States, but they have a very um, open um, copyright. Um, so feel free to use it in your work or any of your educational stuff that you're doing. Um, but it's a really great visual for demonstrating the various ways in which people get stuck uh, in a situation of violence that are then what you see as an outsider is maybe the physical violence piece, but there's actually all of these other pieces that are holding that in place. I see that someone has raised their hand. I don't know if that means someone has a comment. I can't see anybody's faces or hear anybody, but if there's someone who needs to interject. We will have, Julie, we will have a question period shortly. Okay. So you can finish your presentation. And then if anyone, this is Catherine, I'm in the mobilization recruitment office. If anybody has any question, they can use a chat function and use the ask a question account for Julie. All names and everything will remain confidential. This is definitely a safe space to ask Julie's question. We will uh, go through, we will do those at the end of the presentation. Perfect. Merci. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was being heard because like I said, it's very odd for me not to be interacting with folks, but it's just impossible uh, in our online world. So thank you for your patience, folks. Um, yeah, so just a recognition that this, this is like pre-COVID, right? We're looking at pre-COVID women having um, coercion and threats used to keep them in place, intimidation, um, put downs, just eroding someone's self-esteem to the point where they don't even think they deserve better. Um, isolating them, gaslighting them. So, um, you know, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, but a lot of folks don't know what it means. So it's born from a play where a man who was abusive to his partner, this is back in the day when people lit with a gaslight, would turn the gaslights on and off. And so she would say like, is there something going on with the lights? And he would say no, um, to the point where it drove her crazy. Uh, and so then he was able to point and say like, well, my wife is crazy, who can really believe her? So it's a form of psychological torture. It's not just lying to someone. It's a very, very specific form of violence um, where you make someone doubt their own perception of reality. As well, using children or pets as leverage or as a bargaining tool to keep someone in a, in a situation of violence, as well as economic abuse. So making it so that someone doesn't have control over their own money, um, making it so that they can't afford to leave, um, that they don't have any equity as a result of having nothing in their name. Now take that and you can crank the volume way up in the context of COVID. Isolation is what we're all experiencing right now. You could be single and or living in the most beautiful of relationships right now and you're still isolated. We're all isolated by default to try to deal with this global pandemic. Many of us are experiencing economic hardship right now. We've lost our jobs, we've lost significant forces, um, you know, sources of income. Um, you know, maybe you're eligible for CERB, maybe you're not. CERB is like peanuts and it's still more than folks make on disability. 
So people are experiencing economic hardship across the board. People are isolated across the board. Um, and that is exacerbating an already heinous situation. And so as someone who does this work, for example, when I hear people talking about, I can't wait for things to go back to normal, I have to look back at the statistics that tell me that, you know, last year, somewhere around 140 women and girls were killed, most of them killed by men, most of them killed by men who claim to care about them. Um, that's not a normal I want to go back to. We need to do better than that. Um, and so it's important for us to understand the structures that keep women in positions of violence um, instead of individualizing it as, you know, why didn't she leave or any of those kinds of pieces. I want to um, take a second and really just use the rural versus urban um, divide to really drive home this point and to really, I think, um, this is like the activist -y part in me. I come from rural, small town, Northern Ontario. Um, I've worked in largely rural, small town, remote communities. And the reality of domestic violence and sexual violence is unbelievable. And it doesn't seem to ever hit the radar. And that's my own personal pet peeve, <laughs> is I live in an urban area, but I'm not an urban person because I don't come from an urban space. And so it's shocking to me how much we ignore what's going on in rural communities until we have um, you know, a major news story like we did this year. So important to know that in 2019, so last year, 38% of women and girls who were killed were killed in a non-urban setting. And that's shocking in and of itself, but it's extra shocking when you realize that only 16% of Canadians live in a non-urban setting. So women in rural, remote, northern communities, small towns are way overrepresented in rates of femicide in this country. Um, if this is work that you're interested in, I would also just kind of, as a feminist gerontologist by training, I would also um, just put a little pin to let you know that uh, women over 55 are also extremely overrepresented in cases of femicide in Canada. So everyone's getting upset right now about elder care in this country, which is great. That is a long overdue conversation. But I, I encourage you to think beyond the safety of long-term care and thinking about how women over 55 represent a small percentage of the population, but a huge percentage of the folks who are being killed uh, as a result of domestic violence, and most often as a result of murder suicides in particular. But going back to the rural urban divide, I'm going to give you two very quick examples of that to show you what that looks like in practice. There is, uh, in 2015, there was a triple femicide in the community of Wilno in Ontario, which is about an hour or so outside of Ottawa. A man was thankfully caught after a manhunt and he murdered three women, Natalie and Anastasia, excuse me, <coughs> and Natalie, Carol and Anastasia. And all three women uh, knew that he was a threat to them. Two of the women had actually reported him to police and he had actually been incarcerated for committing violence against one of the women. So this is someone who was known to them and to the community as abusive. Um, and he still managed to uh, kill them all in a killing spree that was extremely heinous. One of the women in particular um, had a panic button that the OPP had given her um, because they knew that Basil was a threat to her. Um, but because she lived in a rural community, she hit that panic button and it took about a half an hour for police to get to her home and by then she was already killed. So the geographic isolation on top of the isolation that women already experience um, was a huge factor to what happened in Wilno. Sure, I don't have to tell you much about what happened in Porta Pic, uh, Nova Scotia this April. Um, same thing, this is someone who was known in the community as being very wealthy, but we're now hearing was also known for being um, violent, for being just shady. <laughs> Um, someone who had made threats towards police, had made, was, you know, had committed domestic violence, physical domestic violence in front of other people. Um, there had been multiple calls to police and nothing was done and he was able to kill 22 people. I am happy to report that as of a few hours ago, the government has finally agreed to conduct a public inquiry. Um, so hopefully we'll get some answers about what happened there. Um, but, you know, these stories make the news and, and, and thankfully, there's some attention paid to it, but what's happening in rural communities is often quite ignored. 
Um, and so just some unique factors for women and girls in rural Canada at any point, not just within COVID, um, inherent isolation. So using um, Natalie Warmerdam as an example, this was a woman who the police knew where she lived. She lived in the country. She had cameras around her home. She had done everything she could to kind of fortify her house, but she lived in the country. So there's not going to be a police detachment two seconds from your house. That's impossible. Also, there's no traffic driving by necessarily. Your, your house is away from the road, right? All the things that we love about rural living make it that it's very difficult for folks to know what's going on in your life. Confidentiality is also a huge issue for all survivors, but especially when you live in a community where everybody's known everybody their whole life. I mean, I'm from small communities all over Northern Ontario. I've known, you know, the same people since kindergarten. Many of them still live there. So if you're contacting police, maybe police is your abuser's uncle, or, you know, if you're going to access health services, maybe the nurse is your abuser's ex-wife. Like, the ability to share your story and have it actually be kept secret is pretty difficult generally, but especially when you live in a small town. Also, just the existence that services are out there, uh, let alone being able to access them. So, you know, there's no public transit in most small communities. So you need a vehicle, you need money to be able to get there. And also, you know, if you're sharing a vehicle with your abuser, they're going to ask, where are you going? You can't blend in uh, and just discreetly access a service as well as physically being able to. So for example, in Renfrew County, which again is a catchment area just outside of Ottawa that includes Wilno, it could be an hour and a half to access the sexual assault center. There's one sexual assault center with a catchment area the size of Prince Edward Island. So the practicality of being able to drive an hour for an hour therapy appointment to then come back for, like, it's just not feasible. Not to mention, people don't often even know the services that exist because they're not well advertised. A huge factor uh, for all forms of gun violence, actually not just domestic violence, um, is the prevalence of guns. I am a white woman from Northern Ontario who does not know a single person in my family who does not own at least one firearm. Um, everyone I know hunts, everyone I know has guns, um, and again, whether that gun is used in a, in a case of domestic violence or not, you know it's there. And just the threat that that person can access that weapon keeps people afraid, rightfully so, um, and keeps them um, stuck in situations of violence. And then just generally, unfortunately, uh, you know, most Canadians don't live in rural, remote, northern, small towns. And so those communities are often very economically disadvantaged, high, high levels of poverty, um, oftentimes very huge discrepancies. So the Muskoka, for example, uh, anyone who loves to go to cottage country, there's a huge divide of folks who are very wealthy, who have beautiful cottages, who are there for just the summer, and then folks who are there all year round who have you know, very few economic opportunities outside of the summer season. So lack of economic opportunity to get the heck out of there. Um, and also sometimes, you know, just a general sense that you, you're, you're stuck in your small town. And I think anyone who's from a small town, you oftentimes only appreciate it once you leave, because I think we all just kind of feel stuck but you can feel very stuck um, if your job is as a cashier at a grocery store in a small town where you don't know anyone outside of that community. So the thought of leaving is terrifying. And then lastly, a thing that we can all, I think, just think about is there's stigma attached to saying you experience violence generally. Um, but when you live in a small town, when you experience, um, you know, the economic disadvantages that come from that, when you're deemed, you know, a redneck or white trash or any of those things, talking about violence that you've experienced, especially family violence, can play into the stigma. Um, you know, to be blunt, like I said, I'm, I'm from small towns, like dots on the map in Northern Ontario, where jokes about people being inbred, like, that's just what people say. I mean, even when I moved to Ottawa, I got so much of that. What if you're experiencing family violence, right? What if you're a survivor of incest? You're not going to talk about those things because it feeds a stereotype that you've been fighting against your whole life. So there's an extra layer of stigma that really keeps people in a place where it's like, of course, I live with a man who beats me. I'm from a small town. This is such a cliche. Um, and that, those kinds of things, that stigma stops people from accessing support. I want to shift gears a bit before we shift and talk about 
the solutions piece, because like I said, I'm going to come at you with some hard truths and then we're going to figure out how to solve this problem. But in order to do that, I think it's really important that we take some time to unpack this, the concept of resilience, which is a concept that I've wrestled with personally and professionally for quite some time. Um, I did my grad work on the reality of being an elderly woman living in poverty in Canada. And what I found over and over again was these women who were so proud that they were from the generation that pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, that I don't need any help. Look at me, I'm stoic, I'm thriving. But in fact, they weren't. Um, and they were suffering. And the suffering that they experienced was erased by the fact that they had really projected this image of themselves as being, of not needing any help, that I can do this on my own. Um, and I really, that really stuck with me. You know, here I was trying to research what it's like to be, you know, over 65 living in poverty. But instead, instead I ended up having this incredible conversation with 18 women about resilience and the double bind of it. And that was really reinforced for me doing work with sexual assault survivors, where they had to really walk this fine balance of looking bad enough so that people recognize that their trauma was real, but not being so messy that people think, well, she's an unreliable narrator. She's hysterical. She's making it up. Look at her. She's all over the place. And the most concrete example I've seen of that in the public sphere of the last few years is um, when Dr. Christine Blasey Ford was testifying against Brett Kavanaugh in the U.S., a case that, again, I find interesting that Canadians were watching minute by minute because it doesn't impact us, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, but we walked live as Christine, as Dr. Ford, sat there and tried, you could just see in her face that she wanted to show how upsetting that sexual assault had been to her, how traumatizing it was, but she also knew that she would be painted as hysterical if she was too emotional. And so you could tell if you have any sort of trauma-informed lens that this woman was like walking a delicate balance, right? Um, and so I say this because I want us to really, yeah, be critical of this idea that like, oh, well, they seem fine. Look at her. She's doing great. Or, you know, she's struggling a little bit, but she's, I know her, like she's tough. And she like, when the going gets tough, she gets going. Um, because that's not actually quite helpful. And what it does is it often is used to erase people's pain. And so as someone who does this work professionally, as I said, who studied this issue academically, but then who lived it, I can't emphasize enough how I understand that our focus on resilience is a means to an end. It's a means of showing people that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that it, your life is worth fighting for, that what happened to you happened for a reason so that you don't feel like, the, like all of, I get it. It's a beautiful sentiment, but I was someone who uh, just a few years ago came out about the fact that I had been stalked by an abusive ex-partner for over a decade. And in that decade, I also successfully lobbied to change legislation in Canada. I got a sexual assault center on my campus. I did work with my public transit authority. I took on the Canadian Armed Forces. I did lots of really great extroverted, strong seeming work. And so when I came forward and said, you know, now that my stalker has died, I can tell you the truth, which was I've been living in fear for over 10 years. People could not reconcile the two. People thought I either was exaggerating how bad it was because you seemed fine, or they thought something, something about you is not real or not authentic because people who are in pain don't get stuff done and you got stuff done. So help me understand this cognitive dissonance that I'm having. And so it's important for me to really name that because if you're thinking in your own life of who is struggling right now, if you're thinking in your own life about people who might need that check-in, I was not someone you would have checked in on. I was never screened at doctor's offices. I was never screened anywhere. I went, no one even thought to check in with me because I seemed fine. Um, and so I really want us to do the cliched, you know, Instagram thing of like, you know, check in on your strong friends, like actually check in on your strong friends, but also think about how our capacity to be resilient is tied to things like privilege. It's tied to things like, you know, whether the system is there for you or not, right? And so oftentimes it's, it's not a personal failing if you're not being resilient, you're just trying to live in this world. Um, that's really, really difficult. And going back to the elderly women that I studied, they're 
emphasis on resilience and stoicism and being seen as powerful, I'm nobody's victim, didn't help them because no one saw their pain. And so no one thought to, to ask them how they were doing. And from a systemic level, elderly women are one of the poorest demographics in Canada. But you would never know that because we don't talk about it because we think they're doing well because pride and stoicism and resilience is part of that generation's way of surviving the horrors of war and all of these things, right? Um, so I just want to challenge you to think about that. I'm just going to like plant that seed and let it grow. Um, but especially when you're thinking about what friends do I might be struggling right now, I want you to just assume all of them. Because <laughs> I don't think most of us are doing super well right now. And many of us are really good at hiding how we're really doing because we want to be seen as strong because the second you're seen as a traumatized person there's connotations of weakness of your whiner you're not strong you know all of those kinds of things and we really got to let that go um, and just prioritize people being honest about how they're doing so i'm gonna hope my thingy there we go so i want us to think about how to be a good friend and how to be a good listener uh, and I want us to pivot to thinking about, okay, Julie, I get it. Intimate partner violence was happening before COVID. It's happening now in a big, bad way. What do I do about it? SpongeBob and Patrick are my favorite metaphor for friendship um, and just looking out for folks. So that's what we're going to do. So first things first is you got to make it your business. You have to make it your business. You don't have to be someone like me with years of experience in this work. Um, you just have to be somebody who cares enough to ask a question. And again, I cannot emphasize enough how I am here today. I survived two years of domestic violence, 10 years of being stalked because my friends were there for me. The police were not there for me. My school was not there for me. My employer was certainly not there for me. Members of my family were not there for me, but I had friends. And my friends were equally as young, as uninformed, and as terrified as I was. And so if my 20 to you know, 30 year old friends that I had during that decade could still show up for me, even though they were as ill-informed as I was, that tells me that we all have capacity to do it. Um, we just have to get over the, the socialization that we have, especially in this country, especially if you're white, um, to just mind your business, right? I think. It sounds cliche, but like the bystander effect is real. People don't stick their neck out for other people. They're just, they're not doing it. Um, and we need to get over that awkwardness and just be explicit in asking and checking in, especially in the context of COVID where picking up on the cues or the, the body language is difficult because we're having conversations generally through a screen. Um, and so it's harder to pick up on the nuance. So you just gotta be explicit and just name it. So the first thing to do to solve this problem is just like name that you have a role to play in it. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say, especially in a workplace context, is establish regular check-ins. And again, I leave that to you to figure out what that looks like depending on your work climate, depending on the vibe of your workplace, but just setting up regular check-ins with folks whether it's you know literally scheduled you know two three times a week or once a week whatever it is or if it's just informally um but making sure that you're checking in in a really concrete way and if you're an employer or a supervisor or someone who has any level of power in the workplace be aware of that power dynamic and be open to hearing someone say you know not great julie Right, we want to move beyond the pleasantries of like, yeah, I'm good or not too shabby, you know, just like get concrete with folks and, and, and project that sincerity. If you're trying to um, also make it that folks can disclose in a context in which it might not be easy for them to do because they are working, you know, with on Microsoft Teams in the middle of a dining room with four kids running around and a dog and all of those things. Um, then a way that you can subtly show folks that they can you know let you know that they're not doing well is you can do things like establish a code word so if someone says you know yellow or octopus or some random word or a specific sentence then that's a cue that that person is not doing well and needs you to check in with them confidentially also the canadian women's foundation um, came up with the violence at home signal for help 
Um, so if you go to Canadian Women's Foundation, you can grab this graphic. And there's also a short 30 second YouTube clip that they've uh, made to show people what that means. So, I mean, I've sent this to all of my friends, so it doesn't have to be in a formal workplace, but if, you know, I Zoom with my friends two, three days a week, um, we watch movies together, we do a thing, and we just know that, like, if someone does this, then that person is saying, I am not safe. Um, and so just normalize that. Again, you can just send it around as like, hey, look at this interesting thing that Canadian Women's Foundation came up with. We just thought we'd send it to everyone as an FYI. Um, and it's just a great way to, to folks to be able to be like, I'm in a meeting, but I'm going to flag for you that like, once this is done, I need your help. Um, so again, whether it's a code word or a hand signal, just an idea, um, Canadian Women's Foundation came up with, which I think is excellent. Also safety planning. So safety planning um, literally saves lives. <laughs> um, and I'm giving you, I uh, just copied here, a screen grabbed an example from Make It Our Business, which if you're not familiar with them, get on it. Their work is incredible. Um, it's based out of, the, out of Western University, the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. Uh, but Make It Our Business ha is a great spot to find all kinds of resources for employers who are looking to be there for their employees and their teams during um, moments of crisis, including domestic violence. So they have an individualized workplace domestic violence safety plan. This is this little, like you literally just download this Word document from their website for free. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a snippet just to sort of show you what a safety plan could look like. Now this one specifically was written pre-COVID, um, but I'll show you some things that you could add to it in the current context if you're still working entirely remotely. Um, so one, just the fact that you're having a sit down with someone and coming up with a safety plan means you're already doing better than most. <laughs> so don't be afraid of making a mistake. Just have a really practical conversation with them. So who is going to be, right? So this is the guideline and you could come up with this together. You both agree to it and then you both can make sure that you follow through. So again, it's several pages long, so you can take from it what uh, you like, and because like I said, it's a Word document, so you can easily edit it, it's perfect. Um, but things like, you know, moving the desk away from entrance and windows, again, if you're in the office, um, a big one is like removing people's names or contact information in a directory. That's not always possible, especially if someone has a prominent role within the organization. But this is one that I've definitely had to use in the past where I had to be very blatant with my employer and saying, you can't post my phone number or email address um, anywhere on the site. If you want to post the name of my role and, you know, comms at blah, 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 that's fine. But please don't put Julie Lalone communications, blah, blah, blah. It's not safe for me. Um, so just being aware of like ways in which someone could Google or find that information. Um, again, if someone's sitting at the front door, making sure that there's safety for them physically within that space, everything from, you know, the safe entrance to the building, um, to, you know, do you want someone to walk you to your car? Uh, again, in Ontario, we have legislation that is very clear that you have to make sure that folks are safe in the workplace. And that includes folks who are working remotely. So really having a concrete plan with someone Again, not only will those concrete steps possibly save their life, but just on principle, if an employer sat down with me and said, we're taking this seriously and let's work together to make you as safe as possible, I would feel taken care of. I would feel like I wasn't a burden. I would feel like, wow, people here really care about me. And that's the energy we wanna to bring to this issue. <clears throat> so again, um, make it our business. I have the link um, I've included the link on the very last slide and I'll have that up during the Q&A. So if you want to um, look that up, incredible resources, very, there's infographics, lots of really great free stuff for you to use, especially if you're an employer or someone who, whose role it would be to, to put together a safety plan. If that doesn't work um, and folks have maybe perhaps very individualized needs or you're maybe talking about you know, not someone that you work with, but a friend of yours or, you know, someone who coaches your kid's hockey team that you're worried about. Uh, there's a great new free app called My Plan. Uh, so it's myplanapp.ca. 
again, I have that uh, on the last slide. And it's a free app to help you come up with your own safety plan. So if that person is you know, strictly working from home, then they can include stuff from that. Um, if someone has children or dependents, that they can include those things as well. Um, you know, making sure that you know, if you're leaving a situation of violence, do you have all of your important information, you know, your passport, your birth certificate, um, some cash, um, you know, anything that is important to you that if you leave here and you, you know, you're okay never seeing it again, that kind of stuff, like making sure that people think as concretely as possible. If you have a dog, where's the dog going to go? Um, if you have kids, what are you going to do with the kids? Are you going to notify their childcare provider of what's going on? Like it just really gives people concrete steps to break it down so that it's not too scary and overwhelming. Um, and it's also, you know, you have your own pin so that the person can't hack into it as easily. Um, so it's, it's private, it's free, it's free, it's free, it's free, which is the important piece. Um, and for folks who want an individualized plan and who are a bit tech savvy, um, it's a great tool. So if you are talking about remote work, so let's say I'm living in a situation of violence, I'm at home working from the office, my office is, you know, this space. One of the things to do is to just try to make sure that the online work is as safe as possible, right? Abusers are not just coming after us in real life. They're also hacking into our information, trying to get access to our work, trying to sabotage us, trying to threaten us, intimidate us terrify us, frankly. Um, and so if I have to work online, things like, okay, are we all of our meetings password protected? Um, again, there's no foolproof plan to this. If an abuser is very tech savvy, they will find a way. But if we can minimize, that's excellent. Same thing with VPNs. If you have a VPN that you require your staff to use because you deal in sensitive work, that's amazing. And make sure that you create the possibility for folks to use the VPN even when, you know, outside of the work hours. So having a VPN changes where your IP address is, so it's very, very difficult for someone to track where you are specifically. And if someone is being, is living in a situation of violence, which again, doesn't necessarily mean living in the same house. It could be a partner who lives across town. It could be an ex-partner that they've left who won't leave them alone. Just letting them know that having a VPN is a, is a, small way that you can try to at least make it so that your cloud is more difficult to hack into um, and all of those kinds of pieces. So again, if you're already using VPNs, just let people know, by the way, this is a great way to keep your stuff safe um, if you wanna just keep the VPN on anytime you use the internet at home. Promote resources. So typically this is the part of the presentation where I would say, you know, here are some great free posters that you can put up in the lunchroom and in the conference room and in the entrance and, you know, and I believe in that. And when we go back to interacting in real life more often, then I will, you know, keep that in your back pocket. But in our current context right now, that's things like if you have a newsletter that you put out or um, any kind of email listserv, just including a resource. Here's an interesting YouTube video on this, or, you know, here's a great app that people can download. Just really making it just seamless, just like part of what we do. So you're not raising any alarms for folks who are just saying like, hey, we recognize this might be your world. So let's just talk about it. Uh, same thing with social media. So if your organization has a lot of social media, you as a person, you know, posting on your social media, here's a really cool resource. Hey, did you know this existed? Hey, did you know this? It's just a way to flag for the folks in your world that this is something that you care about and that they can talk to you. And then, yeah, if you're having team meetings of any kind, bringing it up, bringing up, you know, here's an interesting resource, maybe you bring up something per session, just to keep it on people's minds so that folks who are suffering might not feel comfortable today, but if in two weeks from now they realize like, hey, this is something that people really do take seriously, then I know who I can talk to. Uh, again, whether you're talking online or you're talking uh, once we go back physically um, to hanging out at the workplace, um, a great way to make sure that you maintain momentum is to just promote, you don't even have to organize it yourself, but maybe promote existing trainings that are happening. Um, so for example, I can say, if you're interested in the issues of online harassment, um, Hollaback, which is an organization I work with, um, our headquarters in New York is organizing free webinars this week on how to be an ally to someone who's being harassed online, being like viciously trolled, 
how can you be an ally if you just see someone being attacked on Instagram? That's a free webinar that folks can attend. So just like promote it. You don't even have to come up with it yourself, but just being like, hey, cool, this is like a learning opportunity if this is something that you're interested in. Because one, we want to build equipped allies. And two, we want to let folks know who are suffering that like we give a damn because we're investing time and energy in this. So this is an incredible part of that conversation and I'm grateful that you're doing it. Um, and so it's exactly this, you know, it's bringing folks in, whether it's about gender-based violence, bystander intervention, um, any kind of issue, just making it known that like this is part and parcel of working here is caring about these issues. So I wanna end with when you're having a personal chat with someone. So again, not just at work, these are life skills. And I will tell you that the, the, these two pieces I teach to people in the sixth grade. I've spent almost 20 years working on this issue. I've spent over 10 of them as an educator who's been traveling the country, training people on how to end gender-based violence. And I work with groups ages 12 and up. So I have conversations with like 13 year olds on how to be an ally to folks and they get it. So I don't say that to say like, children can get it, what's your excuse? I'm just, I say it to be like, we can do this. Like these are fundamental skills that we should absolutely be teaching people as early as possible. So if you are concerned about someone, so this person hasn't disclosed to you, they haven't said I'm living in a situation of violence or I have a stalker, you're just picking up some vibes or you're picking up some cues that this person is just not themselves. Um, and you wanna inquire, um, this is especially relevant if you maybe have interactions with that person's abuser. So I'm thinking, you know, if your friend is dating someone new and they're awful, maybe a family member is, has a new partner that's just not nice to them, and you want to broach the subject, you want to use I see, I feel language. So I see the way that he talks to you. And it makes me sad because I don't like it when people talk to you like that. Or I see that you're just not as outgoing as you used to be. And it makes me sad because I'm, I'm concerned about you. I see, I feel is really important language because oftentimes we mean well, but we screw the whole thing up. Speaking personally, I got a lot of why do you let him talk to you like that? And I remember vividly my father who, you know, to his credit has been very open with me sharing this story because he's learned better. <laughs> when you know better, you do better. Um, but I vividly remember him saying to me, I didn't raise you to tolerate someone talking to you like that. Why do you let him talk to you like that? You're smarter than this. And again, the intent there was almost like, I think of it as like in black and white movies when women are hysterical and they're kind of screaming and someone like kind of knocks a sense out of them. Like that's what he thought he was doing, but instead he was making me feel stupid, embarrassed, humiliated. Like I was a disappointment. Like it was just such a heavy thing to put on me. And also you're mimicking the same words of my abuser. Like you're basically telling me I'm not smart. And like, that's what he tells me every day. So why do I need you to remind me, you know? But again, I get that people are just like, snap out of it. But that's not what this is, right? And so I see, I feel really cuts the judgment and just says like, look, I don't have all the facts and I'm not in your shoes. But from my perspective, what I see concerns me. And I just want to share that with you. Now, if someone does disclose, if someone does say, hey, this is happening to me or this has happened to me, then I'm sorry, I'm here for you. What do you need? I'm sorry. I'm here for you. What do you need? That's what we need folks to understand. It's not your job to swoop in there and fix that person's problem. They have agency, they have power, and it's just reminding them of the power that they do have and the options that they do have and the options that you're going to help them find. But don't assume you know what that person needs. Don't assume that you know the perfect path for them to walk down because you don't. And you want it to be a collaborative conversation. Because remember, the, the crux of intimate partner violence, of sexual assault, is taking someone's power away from them. It's that person saying no, and that no not being respected. And so as an ally, it's so important that we give that person power back to say, you know what's best for you. Do you want to know what your options are? Let's talk about our options. There's you know, these three options. Or do you want me to call somebody and make a call? Do you want me to 
you know, take care of your kids so that you can go and file a report or do you need me to help you find a lawyer? Like whatever it is, but don't assume that you know what the right answer is for them. Just let them know I am here as a guide to point you in a direction. I can't be your therapist. It's not appropriate, right? Unless you're that, in that job, right? But I can be an ally and an ally is I got tools in my toolbox. What do you need? And let's walk that path together. So I'm sorry, I'm here for you. What do you need? Right? That's the kind of language that we want to use. So I want to end um, there to let you know that, again, these are the, the two resources in particular that I referenced, but there are so many. So if this is an issue that you're interested in, again, please get in touch with me. That's um, how you can get my email through my contact page on my website. Um, if issues of intimate partner violence are interesting to you, and in particular, the conversations around resilience. Um, my book came out, ironically, the day the pandemic was declared. Um, <laughs> it's called Resilience is Futile, and I talk about my experience of intimate partner violence. Um, but in particular, I, I try to use it as a vehicle to talk about those, the complexity of, of resilience um, and how we get to a place of letting people be vulnerable and honest about their trauma. So that's it for me. I'm going to, um, I think I'll leave the screen up unless anyone has any objection, just so that folks can write down those resources if they'd like them. But otherwise I will wait for questions. That's awesome, Julie. We're just gonna go to Jenny, who ha may have some questions from a participant. Jenny, do you have any questions? I do, and thank you for that presentation, Julie. I have a, a few questions here for you. First one came through, and it says, what can you do if you are from a small town and need or want to get help? Well, um, I would say that in Canada, we are quite lucky that we have um, a national we have national organizations and we also have provincial organization support lines and most communities have some semblance of a support line. So I would say to, um, if it's not safe for you to Google and have a trace at your house, ask someone else to do it. Um, but there are absolutely domestic violence, sexual assault, shelter, you know, counseling, whatever umbrella type organizations accessible either in person or virtually um, across Canada. So just being aware that you might not have heard of those services, but they're out there. And that's one of the unfortunate realities of our work is our work isn't super visible unless it touches someone personally. Um, so again, if you can't Google it safely, ask someone else to do it. And I guarantee you there's somebody somewhere in your community whose job it is to, to support you. Great. So another oh. question. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I just want to know that if ever is somebody's in a position of, of violence or domestic violence, they can always contact the union as well. Um, should I use your website, Julie, as a reference? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the best way to ask a friend or colleague if they're okay and to get an authentic answer? Um, that's a great question. And I would say as corny as it may seem as someone who hates role playing um, and will never make you do it in my presentation, um, do that. Like just find language that feels natural to you um, and find language that yeah, that you feel comfortable with, because then that will project what you're trying to get across. And also to just name when it feels awkward. Like I'm a big fan in, of saying, I literally don't know what to say to you right now, but I just like, my heart is here and I, what, what can I do? You know, like, don't be afraid to kind of stumble. And if you feel like you don't have the right answer, then saying that is a heck of a lot better than silence. But I think just finding Finessing language that feels real to you is the best way to get that to, to come across. And again, if you're like, I'm just perpetually awkward, then just name that. <laughs> and I think that in itself is authentic and saying, this is not a conversation I'm comfortable having, but I really want to have it with you. Okay. All okay, right. So the next question is, what is the best way to speak to a manager who does not believe their employee is in a domestic violence situation? 
Uh, well, I would send them this link. Um, and in my experience, those sort of passive ways are a great first step. Um, I remember one training I did, for example, with a union where they took the huge stack of posters that I had about workplace sexual harassment and put them up in the office. And that was their kind of subtle, uh, kind of activisty way of saying like, we're gonna talk about this whether you like it or not. And then the women in the office started chatting and then all of a sudden it was a topic on the agenda. And then all of a sudden they had a training and, and things kind of went from there. Um, so I think you can try going at it indirectly. Uh, and if the message is not picked up on, then I think you go to the direct route. And if you don't feel comfortable, maybe bringing people with you or you know drafting an email and getting other folks to sign on to it um, to just really drive home the fact that this is something happening in our workplace because it's happening everywhere. Um, and sometimes kind of like depersonalizing it in that way and saying, you know, we have legislative obligations to do something if this is happening. Um, you know, there's legislation, there's policies, there's resources that these things exist. Um, if you, you, the kind of more subtle way doesn't work, then yeah, you just go for it. But again, like roll deep if it helps in terms of like find other people to come with you so that you're not written off as like the one lone person in the office who cares about it. Okay, great. Um, and the last question, um, do you see the, that there are any extra complications in the NCR compared to those working in different provinces? Um, that's a great question. I think in my experience as someone who has lived here a long time but still doesn't feel like I'm really from here, I feel like there's a politesse in this region that is like a politeness, a um, yeah, kind of a sense that like we're all professionals um, and there, you know, we all have to be nonpartisan and we all have to be neutral and we all have to be this because if I say something and it's misconstrued, like there's sort of a sense of, yeah, like putty test, there's no other way to say it, um, in the NCR that I really haven't seen elsewhere in my work in Canada. Um, that I think is absolutely um, an impediment and, it, and especially for folks who work like in the public service um, there's a real sense that it's almost its own community you know we all speak our own language I remember when I worked for the federal government it was like what are these acronyms everyone's speaking a different language I don't understand like there's it's very insular um, and I think and there's a real sense that especially if you're ambitious which is not a bad thing but especially if you're ambitious and you're always aware of making connections um, and, you know, leveraging networks, there's oftentimes a real reticence to name problems because you don't want to seem like someone who's rocking the boat. And, you know, the NCR is technically a big city. Like, you know, we've hit over a million people now, but it has a small town vibe. And I think it's particularly insular um, the, the more you drill down. And so I think that level of almost like waspy, <laughs> you know, like we just don't talk about certain things. I've definitely picked up here more than actually more than I've done work with the public service in Montreal, for example, and I didn't get that same sense. So I do think there's something particular um, to our region. Okay, great. So that's all the questions we have from the chat. Awesome. Okay. Sorry. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to ask Catherine, sorry, Julie, um, on that last question, um, I think uh, there was more a sense of um, legal obligations to say, I live in Ontario, my domestic uh, violence is happening in Ontario, but I work in Quebec uh, and the, inter and the um, interplay between the agencies. Is there, do they talk to each other in the NCR or do you really have to report it to both agencies uh, in Quebec, in Ontario to be safe in, in both your home and your workplace? So, legislatively in if you work in ontario even if you live in quebec if you work in ontario then i think it's oh, i always mess it up it's like bill 132 i think um applies to you whether you you know fly in from manitoba or not like if you're working in ontario if your employer is considered ontario um then that legislation covers you regardless um, i'm not as familiar with legislation on the quebec side but again it's it's depending on which legislation you're tackling. If it's domestic violence in the home, then it's where you're living. Um, but if you're working outside of province. So it can be 
a bit of a hot mess, certainly. Um, but I think it's again, if you are working in Ontario, regardless of where you live, that legislation applies to you because that legislation is specific to um, DV in the workplace. And it was a result of a nurse in the Sarnia area who was killed um, by an ex who was a doctor at that hospital. They knew she was experiencing stalking from him and they didn't actually, they made it so they both worked on the same shift. Um, and that's when she was killed. And so Ontario has very specific and quite robust legislation as a result of that, that my understanding is covers folks um, regardless of where they live and also covers it in the current context of working from home um, as well. Great. So we did get another question and is, I work in a male dominated field and I would like to know if we can do something to change an abuser's behavior. Yes, we can. Um, and there's different ways in which we can do that. But the biggest thing I want you to know is we can absolutely prevent violence against women. And the vast, vast, vast majority of the time, we can also um, get abusers to understand what they're doing. Um, in the cases in which we can't, then we have to use our collective um, powers to boot those people from those spaces. Um, but it is, it, it's a mighty task as someone who trained the Canadian Armed Forces was sexually harassed the whole time and then had to be under police protection for several months because people were so mad at me um, we now have Operation Honor so it doesn't fix the problem um, but I think I don't want folks to be discouraged if you're in a minority position in the workplace whether it's you know that you're one of the few women or one of the few folks of color um, there are absolutely ways in which abusers can have uh, a moment of recognition for what they've done, but you need the buy-in at the institutional level or at least within your peer group um, because being, I'm sure one person can single-handedly shift a whole system, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm like, at what cost? Um, and it's not fair to you to have to bear the burden of years of you know, systemic sexism. But the short answer is absolutely people can see the light and I'm, quite lucky in my career that I've seen lots of folks personally and professionally who people had written off as like you know he's old that's just how he is things can't change um to being an ally um but again it's not up to the folks who are directly impacted who are targeted to have to shoulder that work it's up to everyone else to to stand alongside them okay and we had another question come in are these helpful to a man that experiences domestic violence as well? Yes, absolutely. So um, the Make It Our Business and the My Plan app, for example, so just the practical resources work for anybody. Um, in terms of you know how to check in with folks, same thing. Um, and I think that's why normalizing check-ins is so important because it, it covers a whole plethora of different things and it doesn't make it so that if, for example, there's only two women in the office and they're the ones that everyone looks to when they talk about these issues. Like that's not helpful for those women. And it's certainly not helpful for the men who might be quietly suffering. So really, truly all of the resources um, are good across the board, regardless of your situation, including, as I said, folks who are not living with um, their abuser, but are still being abused, even in the context of COVID where they're not physically in the same space. Um, these resources can work for all those folks. Great, so that's all the questions from the chat. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Again, this is Catherine Gagnon. I'm from PIPS. Uh, the resources are online. I'm just gonna let Jenny um, give our word of address. But again, the union is here for you. The executive is here for you. And if you need anything, please feel free to reach out. Jenny, to you for the closing remarks. Thank you. Are you going to start my video or I'm just going to be a talking head? I'll be a talking head. That's fine. So, Julie, thank you, do you. you so much. Excuse you? I said, you do you. You can. Okay. No, it won't let me um, turn off my video, turn on my video. That's fine. 
Um, Julie, thank you, and please accept our sincere appreciation for this very informative session. Um, you brought to light some many um, concerning topics, and um, hopefully your resources, we can put them to good use, because um, we know a lot of people out there that are silent, but they did tune in, and we want to be there for them and support them in any way we can. Um, Ray, for all your work and being the foundation to um, aligning PIPs with domestic violence and getting our clauses in there and, and bringing awareness to this subject. Thank you, kudos all along the way. Jen Carr for bringing Julie in, Director Carr, awesome work. Um, I hope our members appreciate everything. You guys have really hit the ground running and brought the resources out and this type of engagement is what we need at this time and for bringing an awareness. So thank you all. Thank you to everybody for tuning in and um, please reach out to any one of us or to PIPS and use Julie's website and her resources. It's all there for the taking. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, a reminder to everyone that this is going to be recorded. So if you have any uh, colleagues who may want to uh, view this, or you want to view it again, or you want to send it to a colleague as a check-in, um, it will be available later on. And for nos amis en français, we're going to be doing this en français again tomorrow. So um, thank you again. Uh, from the bottom of my heart to the Domestic Violence Committee for our gains and to Julie for the excellent presentation on how we can become an ally. Thanks everyone.